Lions have a chance at winning the division. There's no chance this year. Mm, how dare you? There's no chance. The spirit of Detroit. This year. Not in the future. In the future, we have a shot. This year, we got a shot in the ass. When the Lions go 5-12 and 12 this year, not if, when, I wonder how many of these people that, that are singing the praises of Dan Campbell are going to turn on him. I'm serious. I wonder. I, I'm, I'm I being very serious because it's like. You know the people that's going to turn on him? I like the guy. You know the people that's going to turn on him? The people who don't, who, who hasn't been watching. The people that think they're going to go 10 and 7 and go to the Super Bowl? No, the people. You tube. It's your boy Avery Giovanni. I am the host of Spirit of Detroit Podcast. Welcome to Spirit of Detroit Podcast. I love y'all dearly. I love the clicks, the likes, the subscribers, whatever y'all do. People that just, you know, just watch and don't subscribe, click the bell icon button. <laughs> join the believers. Please join. I'm nearing the precipice of 500 subscribers. It's been a great ride. Shout out to Gil Patello, Broken Tubing, John Kapler. Shout out to y'all, man. The guys been rocking with me for a long time. Here at Spirit of Detroit Podcast, we believe in concerted optimism. A conservative optimist operates in a very gray area, okay? I don't like to get too giddy. At drafts, at media press conferences, coaches hire. I don't get too giddy. I've been doing this a long time. I've been doing this since November. And I've never gotten too giddy. But I have to say, uh, this video was planned for a long time. I was going to wait for it, but you know, I think it was needed, especially after the Nikhil Harry video. It was kind of eh. But I'm giddy about this season. I can't lie. I'm fucking giddy. But I'm giddy once more because when I think about it, the Lions can go to the Super Bowl. The Lions can go to the NFC Championship. The Lions can go win the division. The Lions can do anything they fucking want to do. They put their mind to it. I'm not talking crazy. I'm conservative optimism. My stopgap for them is six to seven wins. I'm be satisfied with seven. But if they get 10 wins in the playoff berth, I'm happy. If they get a playoff win. I am I am happy. This coaching staff is wonderful. The the players on the team that are talented, DeAndre Swift and, and a lot of guys we didn't covered. You know, they can do it. Shout out to Braxton Hills. He's a believer. He can do it. And 11 times this has happened in the post-Super Bowl area. Uh, so post-Super Bowl era, post-2000s, you've had teams be fourth in their division, be terrible, be deplorable at the first, have the first pick in the draft, and then go on to be 11 and 5 or 10 and 6, you know, win the division, go to the Super Bowl. This has happened. It's happened for small market teams, big market teams, and I see enough data so I can say the Detroit Lions will win the Super Bowl. <laughs> this thing is trash. Maybe. In this video, we will count uh, count down the five times that a team Went from worst to first. Now, quick parameters. All of these teams got to be in a full rebuild. First or second year. And just to add a little cream to the crop. Everybody got to be 6 and 10 or under. How about that? Even more possibilities. So, without further ado. This is five times a team went from the worst to first. 2008 Miami Dolphins. 1-15 to 11-5. and five. 
Miami Dolphins was for real. Led by Ronnie Brown with and the Wildcat offense. They had just hired Chuck Sperano the previous offseason. Ch- <laughs> Sperano was pretty much a figurehead. Bill Parcells was running that coaching staff. Bill Parcells, who turned over probably five teams in his career, Dallas, the Patriots, Miami, the list goes on, New York, goes on. He was the vice president of operations, and Sperano was kind of his little guinea pig. Sperano incorporated a college offense in the the scheme. 1-15, you had issues at the quarterback position with Chad Pennington and Chad Henney, and you had a certified running game, bona fide defensive attack, you needed to find some type of spark. Now, week three against the Patriots, they did. They employed the Wildcat offense. Had 400 yards of total offense. Led the way with Ronnie Brown. They end up winning the division and going to a playoff. Losing in the divisional round. Honestly, you cannot make this shit up. When you go from 1 and 15 or 11 and 5 and you haven't been in the super uh, you haven't been in the playoffs since what the 1980s. It makes a big deal, a big difference since the Marino era rather. I think the Lions can mirror this. I mean, this team was pathetic. One game, one play away from actually being 0-16. Come on, Detroit. Know who you're talking to. Number four, the 2004 San Diego Chargers. San Diego was a good team. In the middle of a full rebuild after just miffing up the draft two years ago with with Lee. Let's say the fact that I want to say this. People discredit Marty Schonheimer. You know, they discredit him as a Browns offensive coordinator, uh, head coach. They discredit him with the Kansas City Chiefs. They discredit him. They said, he, yeah, he could turn a team around, but he couldn't build a winner or he couldn't win the big game. And honestly, I'm going to give him his roses now. He literally had two seasons with a team and that team went from four and 12 to 12 and four uh to 12 and four and he had the most solid draft in 2004 his draft in 2003 was not that terrific you know uh Drake and Florence a couple other guys weren't that great I'll show them up on the screen but that 2000 that 2003 undrafted rookie class I mean he had names like fucking He had amazing names like that eventually became pro bowlers in that draft. I mean, that draft produced so many pro bowlers. It's ridiculous. Six pro bowlers. So another thing, another thing he had that 2004 class. I mean, just look at it. Igor Oshansky, Nick Hardwick, Sean Phillips, Michael Turner, Nate Kading, Shane Olivia. These are people who was like actually starting giving good reps quality starts he changed his team around he had 11 picks and seven of them or eight of them he hit on tremendously well i mean he has five or six pro bowlers within this class and don't forget i'm not even naming philip rivers who played for him later in time but when we're talking about the 04 chargers we're talking about a team that had was led by ladanian tomlinson with over 1200 yards rushing we're talking about a team that was led with Drew Brees. We're talking about a team that had a uh, kill at safety. We're talking about a team that played like defensive stout football and you was using their tight end and their run game and didn't have like the best marquee receivers. So we're literally talking about us. I mean, the turnaround aspect is so was so quick. And yes, he had two off seasons. He had a a draft where he just got pieces and he probably had you know an evaluation period but that next draft in 2004 changed his whole team so kudos to him in the um 2004 chargers my biggest thing is people say oh well you know our team you know by by default we can't win because of x y and z by default we can't win because of x y and z and we can't win immediately the 2005 Bears 
are by far the definition of a team that shouldn't have won anything. I mean, you lose your starting quarterback, Rex Grossman, early to injury in preseason. He goes down with an injury. Your starting running back, rookie running back, Cedric Benson, RIP to him, he's held he's holding out all preseason. You start one and three. You're in your second year with Lovey Smith. And Lovey Smith, the first year, showed five and eleven with the same core pieces. So they lost their starting quarterback, don't have their starting running back in in at all in training camp. And then they went on to go win eight consecutive games. They started five and eleven and ended the season eleven and five. And it was their first playoff berth since 2001. I, I just can't make this shit up. What they relied on, they had inconsistencies at quarterback. They had Kyle Orton. Okay, they cut Chad Hutchinson. He went to Dallas and they had Kyle Orton. I mean, we know how bad Kyle Orton was, but Kyle Orton, he finished the year with 1,800 yards. You know, he had 30 sacks. There was there's no excuse for Stafford. This dude had 30 got sacked 30 times. They led the way with a rushing game. 1,300 yards for Thomas Jones, who's not a not a. Not a bad running back. That's not a bad running back. It proved to me, had guys like Roberto Garza, had guys like Erlacher, had guys like Peanut Tillman that were committed to winning and committed to changing this thing around in Chicago. So salute to them. And to me, it's not that hard. You know, it's not that hard for a complete turnaround. And then, yes, they did lose to the Panthers 29-21 um, in the postseason. But look at what they look at. Like they they had no reason to win. They had no reason to be a winner. It went against every storyline you could imagine. So the excuses for Detroit to me are few and far between. Yes, Lovey Smith was in his second year and he had key acquisitions. But at the end of the day, sometimes you just need core beliefs and core things like a solid uh, defense and a solid running game. Shout out to them. So I know you're meeting this list with trepidation by now. Like, well, there's two-year brew builds and people are in their second year of coaching. What if I gave you a new staff, a new coach, new quarterback, new everything? The 2006 New Orleans Saints went from three and 13 to 10 and six, won a one-day division. New Orleans had no excuse to win. No excuse. Just getting back to the Superdome, just being able to play after Hurricane Katrina in 2005, just coming with a, a quarterback with a shoulder in, injury. They signed Drew Brees for $12 million. They signed Scott Fajita, signed some dudes that wasn't really marquee. Terrence Copper off the waiver wire. Uh, Simmons. Some of the signings didn't even make it to training camp because they got injured or they was put on injured reserve. Team had a stellar draft. You had guys like Roman Harper, Reggie Bush, Zach Streif, Jabari Evans. Zach Streif is, went on to play 11 season for them. Jabari Evans, I mean, just a phenomenal draft. You hit on three or four players. You had Rob Ninkovich. You hit in free agency with Scott Fajita, a culture signing. The first signing by Sean Payton. Oh, yes. You get a new offense, a new defensive coordinator, a new head coach, a new quarterback, practically a, a new stadium. It meant so much to those fans to win. It meant so much. And, yes, the Saints have a history just like we do. They had a history of being the Aints, nobodies, lost with Archie Manning. It was everywhere. Winning and having a winning season after this drought of of football. They were practicing at high school stadiums. You know? This team went from the 17th, 20th ranked offense to the first ranked offense. The defense went from 16th to 13th. And yes, it was a complete turnaround in one season. New start, new defensive coordinator, new everything. Now, 
they went to the NFC Championship game. They had success, but they didn't go to the Super Bowl. Next team, it took three years. Well, yeah, two. Two off seasons. The 1999 St. Louis Rams. St. Louis had a big problem. Big problem. The last couple, the last years since 1990 up to 1997, they won 36 games. They were 36 and 70. They were 30 and 76. It was literally no hope in sight. Dick Vermeil took over the reins at four, after 14 years of broadcasting and going to the Super Bowl in the 80s, 83 playing with the Eagles, being the head coach of the Eagles, and the obvious burnout in 85. To me, it's it's just obvious this team has to be, I mean, they're the freaking thumbnail. But you got to look at what this team did. This team had two, a history of losing in the last 10 some years, 10 odd years. You had a new coach. The year they even went to the Super Bowl, they had... A new offensive coordinator had to learn a new offense. In that offseason, they acquired Trent Green, Marshall Falk, Torrey Holt, had a couple guys from the previous draft. They had some pieces. Yes, they had more talent, blah, blah, blah. But obviously, we know what happened to Trent Green. And he went down with injury. We in Detroit have experienced the Mike Marks experience. He made John Kitna a fucking star. Sometimes it's about coaching. But one thing I will give Dick Vermeil credit for was he did something Patricia didn't do. He adapted to his team. His, his pure goal was to work the shit out of his team. Have them conditioned, you know, functional, ready. And doing all that Patriot Way bullshit, which is like work them to death and 1980s, running up hills, all that dumb stuff. Dick Vermeil saw that wasn't working when they was losing. After two seasons of losing, he saw this is not going to work. So what he did was he cut practices down to an hour and a half a day. Going to have two practices, film study. And he'd rather have the smartest team on the field than the most uh, tired team. There were guys actually broken bones, couldn't be a father. They were so tired. And I know it sounds, you know, a lot of my followers are old school guys. But still, when you can't be a father to your kid because your job's fucking you up, you'll actually know what I mean. I look at this team and I liken them to us. Maybe we're three years away. Maybe we're one year away. They did win a division. They did do some things that were big. When the Lions win the Super Bowl this season? Most certainly. Probably not. But all I got to say is the same words that Russell Wilson said to his team in 2012 and 2011. Why not us? I'm your host, Avery Giovanni. This is Spirit of Detroit Podcast. Oh, in the comment section, I'm going to put, uh, no, in this video, I'm going to put some honorable mentions in. I would have tied them in, but it would have been a 30-minute video. Like, comment, subscribe. Man, this video was fun to do. Tell me what you think. Man, it's awesome. We're doing awesome. So, Spirit of Detroit Podcast, we're going to keep them coming. Love y'all.